I am grateful. I'm thankful to be here. I'm, I, I, every time I come onto this stage, it's an emotional thing. I, I, I stand back here with our, our stage logistics team and just worship and pray, and, and, and I thank God for the honor and the privilege. And I ask him every week, may I decrease and you increase. And I pray that you see and hear Jesus today. Amen, somebody? How many lovers of God's word do we have in the house of God today? You guys love the word of God? Amen. We're going to dive into a new series where we're going to study the character of David and study the passages of scripture in the books that really contain his story. And David was like one of the most like chronicled stories in the entire Bible, second only to Jesus himself. Like the most that was written in the Bible, second, like the, the runners up were are Abraham, 14 chapters are dedicated to Abraham in your Old Testament, and he's mentioned in the New Testament. Joseph as well, 14 chapters are dedicated to Joseph's story, and he's mentioned in the New Testament. Next is Isaiah, he gets, he gets a, a, or no, Elijah, who gets 10 chapters, and he's again, he's mentioned in the New Testament a little bit. But David, you guys, has 66 chapters dedicated to his story, 59 times he's mentioned in the New Testament, all that to say, I think God wanted us to know about the life of this king. Like God wanted us to know about this man, this guy named David, that even though David was a flawed man, he made mistakes, he committed sins, and and he kind of messed up. He was God's chosen king of Israel, and that through David, he would send his one and only son, Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, on the throne of David to reign forever. Amen, somebody? His story is important. I think that we can learn a lot in this series. It'll take us about five weeks, I think, that we're going to study this character. Let me jump into this 1 Samuel chapter 13, 14 and talk about where we're going today to set kind of the groundwork, the foundation that we're going to build on, on this man, David. This book, Samuel, was written, or it's the story of the prophet and priest Samuel, taken from his perspective, a lot of it, and this, this scripture kind of picks up the story where Samuel is talking to the first king, Saul. And he tells Saul, the first king, now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart. Today, I want to talk to you about how to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. And God, Samuel says, I've set someone up, a man after my own heart, and appointed him as a ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So what does it mean to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? I want to dispel a few of the myths because I want to talk to you about the preparation of this king, David, and how you and I can become men and women after God's own heart. But before I do, let me kind of dispel some of the myths and tell you what it's not. Like you can, like you can attain this. It's not some lofty thing. We, we read about David and these people in the Bible and some of these heroes of faith and we think like, oh, like that's, that's, that's way up there. I can't really attain that. Let me tell you what it's not. Take some notes with me, you guys, because the first thing that it's not, it's not perfection. It's not perfection. Like, you don't need to be perfect. It doesn't mean that you're never going to make a mistake. You know what's interesting is that, that God summarized David's story, his life's message up in a, in a one-liner. He said, David is a man after my own heart. He could have said many things. He could have said David was a king. David was a great leader. David was an adulterer. David is a murderer. I mean, what kind of one-liners after reading his story, if you didn't know it was a biblical story, would you come up with yourself? He could have said any of those things, but he said, no, David is a man after my own heart. And that's good news for all of us in this room because none of us are perfect. Amen, somebody. Hey, none, none of us are perfect, you guys. And whatever you did in the past does not have to be your one-liner that describes you. See, when God scans the earth for potential leaders, he's not in search for angels in the flesh. He's he's certainly not looking for perfect people because there are no perfect people. He's looking for men and women like you and like me of flesh and bone, but he's looking for people who share the same thing that David had, a heart after him, someone who has a heart after him. God is looking for men and women after his own heart. Something else that a man... uh, after God's own heart, is not, is, it's not someone who's just floating on the clouds. You know what I mean? You know what I mean by that? Like, they just look, like, they're living a stress-free life, a carefree life. They got no problems, no trials, no stress, no pressure. You know what I call that? That's not someone after God's own heart. That's someone after comfort. 
Amen, somebody? That that's someone who, 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 who chooses never to step onto that battlefield and face that giant. That's someone who never steps into the game. That's someone who will never see God do great things because they ain't never willing to do the hard things. Being a man after God's own heart is not trial free. In fact, it's the contrary. It's stepping onto the battlefield, trusting God. Here's the third thing. It's not, it's not really a man after God's own heart. You're not born that way. We look at some people and go, well, they just, they just had, they just have it. They got those qualities. They got those, those things. God just blessed them with more than I have, and I can't really. Now, some people have natural abilities for, like, leadership, but leaders are made, not born. David grew up as a man after God's own heart. Like, he learned how to be, how to set his affection, his focus, his heart upon the Lord. Psalm 25 and 5 gives us a glimpse of of David's heart, all the Psalms really do. Many of the Psalms David wrote, they're, this, they're his diary, his poetry, his, his heart's cry. Look what he says in Psalm 25, 5. Guide me in your truth. Like, God, I don't want my truth. I don't want the world's truth. And I don't, like, if I'm wrong, God, I want you to show me. I don't want to be wrong, God. Teach me, Lord, your ways. For you are my God and my Savior and my hope is in you all day long. My hope is not in all the, the treasury of gold and silver in, 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 the, in the bank. My hope isn't in my money in the bank account. My hope isn't in the army that I'm amassing that can destroy and eviscerate any foe, the Israelite army under David. My hope is not in that. My hope is not in who likes me and who doesn't like me. My hope is not in how many followers I have, how many friends I have. My hope is in you all day long. We get a glimpse of the heart of David who was solely focused on his Lord. David, David was king, but before David was king, Saul was king. But you know who was king before Saul was king? God was king of Israel, which, which kind of begs the question like, why in the world would a people give up God as king and trade it for a man to be king. First Samuel, I know, I'm getting all up in my beard here. First Samuel chapter 8 tells us the story here of when the Israelites came to the prophet Samuel. And, and uh, they tell him this. They go, look, Samuel, you're now old. That's messed up, right? Come on. Samuel, you're, you're, the time has passed, Samuel, and, and your sons aren't like you, which is they, they were messed up. His sons were messed up. They were like not honoring the people, not honoring the ministry or the things of God. And they say, give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. What a dangerous thing when we start craving after things that other people have. When we want to be like other people or want to have what other people have, and this is where they were, God set them apart to be different, not to be ruled like the other nations of the land, but to be ruled by Jehovah, the one true God of the world and creator of the world. And here they are, no, 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 give us a king like all these other nations. And it says that Samuel was displeased with their request, and he went to the Lord for guidance. And God says, do everything they say to you, the Lord replied. For they're rejecting me, not you. They don't want, he says, they don't want me to be their king any longer. They've forgotten about Jericho, that I was the one who crumbled those walls. They have forgotten that when I told the sun to stand still. They forgot that. They forgot all the miracles of Egypt. They forgot the Red Sea and partying, that no king did that. I did that. He says, ever since I brought them from Egypt, they continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now, he says, they're giving you the same treatment. And then he does something that is so dangerous, so dangerous. He says, give them what they want. One of the most dangerous judgments, one of the most harshest judgments that God can give us often is giving us what we ask for. 
You know, like, like giving us exactly, because our prayer, you guys, our prayer should not be going to God going, God, give me what I want. I really want this, and I want this promotion, and I want this job, and I want this wife, and I want this husband, and I want this. I desire this. That should not be your prayer. Your prayer should be, God, give me your desires, because what you want for me is better than what I want for me. What you want for my life is better than what I can create for my life. That should be our prayer, but they get to this place where they're not listening to the prophet. They're not listening to God. And he says, fine, I'm going to give you exactly what you asked. But Samuel, he says, solemnly warn them about the way a king is going to reign over them. And he goes on to tell them. He goes on to tell them, like, he's going to be, he's going to be a king. He's going to take your kids, your sons. He's going to put them in an army. They're going to have to go fight the battle. They're going to have to die for him. He's going to tax you. He's not going to lead you like God leads you. He is a human, and therefore he will fail. Hey, politicians will fail you. Pastors will fail you. I will fail you. Your boss will fail you. People will fail you. But God will never fail you. God is the only one who will never let you down and never fail you. The only one. So you can't put your hope in people. Saul was the first king. He looked the part. He sounded the part. He had power, money, strength. But over time, we see who he really was. He was an insecure leader. And his insecurities got the best of him, and, and it was toxic to everyone around him and the entire nation of Israel. He took matters into his own hands instead of trusting God. Now, David was a sinner, too. Like, he messed up, too. But the difference was David trusted in God even when he messed up. Saul trusted in himself. Saul cared about what people thought about him and how people looked at him. And God eventually rejects Saul as king. I mean, he had potential, he had opportunity, but God said, you missed it, Saul. And I'm going to tell you why in just a little bit here at the, in this message today. But how his heart shifted away from the prophet, away from God, and on to other things. But the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, it says, after he was rejected, Saul, Saul was rejected. The Lord tells Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. And I want to speak to anyone here today that is mourning long enough over the past and the pain and the hurt and that broken marriage or that broken relationships, I believe there is a prophetic word today that's, that God is saying, you have mourned long enough. It's time to get up and grow up. You've mourned, hey, Saul, I'm doing a new thing. Saul, get up. You've mourned long enough. I've rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to, look at this word. We know this word, right? Bethlehem. You see, David is actually a type and a shadow of Jesus. As you see his life and the story of his life, it actually is a type of the Messiah and Jesus. He actually is coming out of Bethlehem. And he tells him, hey, go find a man named Jesse who lives there. For I've selected one of his sons to be my king. So Samuel, he goes on the journey just as, as the Lord instructed. And when he arrives at Bethlehem, the elders of the town Come trembling to meet him. The prophet is here. He's going to exercise judgment. Did we do something wrong? Is this a blessing? What is it? So they arrived, the Bible says. Um, continue. So Samuel did his, yep, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, check this out. This is the prophet of God, by the way. This is, he hears from God. He took one look at the oldest sibling, the oldest sibling of Jesse. Surely this is the Lord's anointed. Missed it. This is not the one. Totally missed it, which... Which kind of, hey, if Samuel, the prophet, misses it, what makes you think you're going to get it right all the time? You're not going to get it right all the time, okay? Look what God says. The Lord says to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. That's not the one. The Lord doesn't see the things the way you see them. Check out what he says. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Hey, can I just say, like, if you're, can I speak to the single people in the room today? Like, if you're single in the room today and the only people that you give a chance or a date or an opportunity have to check off the appearance list first, you are going to miss God's man. You are going to miss God's woman. If she, now, I'm not saying appearances don't matter, but what I am saying is that, is that having that checkbox first is a superficial way to live and you're going to miss the best things of God. Because God does not look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. So Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen 
any of these. So Samuel asked the father, Jesse, are these all the sons you have? So Jesse, what he did is he lined up seven of his sons, but he didn't have seven sons. He had eight sons. So interesting note here, uh, seven in the Bible, seven is the number of completion. Eight is the number of new beginnings. A little hint towards where our eight-year anniversary coming up of discovery in September, the new thing that God wants to do and the new thing that God wanted to birth in the nation of Israel, a new thing, a new reign, someone who would foreshadow Christ. He was going to do a new thing, but he left him out in the, he's like, yeah, oh, yeah, they're still the youngest, you know, but he's out. He's not here right now. He's in the fields. He's like frolicking with the sheep, you know. He's a weird kid. He's, in the, he's a weird kid. He's out there singing and stuff to himself, and like he's going through puberty right now, so he's awkward. He's just an awkward kid. It's just hard to be around him right now. He's got pimples and all this stuff. And, like, and so can, can I just give you like a little parenting tip for, for those of you? Look, all of your kids are going to be different, right? They have different personalities, but all of them are valuable to God. And so this is something that Jesse kind of misses here. He doesn't, he doesn't get this because he plays favorites. Ah, yeah, David, he's a shepherd. He's out there singing in the fields and this awkward kid. The Bible actually says, some of you guys don't know this, but the Bible says that David was born in iniquity. Psalm 51 says David was born in iniquity. So a lot of scholars believe that, that, that either he, Jesse was the illegitimate father like not the biological father, I mean, not the biological father, or, or maybe he was just didn't have the same mother as those seven kids, which again is a foreshadowing of, of the blended family of Jesus and the situation there. And, and maybe there was strife going on. Maybe he wasn't in the lineup because they had a blended family issue going on where you value this side and not this side. Parents value every child. Every child is valuable. Now listen, just because you are not visible to man doesn't mean you're not visible to God. Can I get a better amen right there, okay? God might be hiding you, but not because he doesn't like you, but because he's preparing you for greatness. So Jesse sends for him because Samuel says, well, go get, go get that young kid. Go get that awkward kid. I need, I need to see him. So Jesse sends for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Someone say, I'm the one. You are the beloved of God. You are the one. He says, anoint him. So David, it says, stood there amongst his brothers. And Samuel anoints him with that olive oil. The Lord will cause you to shine in the presence of those who hate you. Hey, they didn't create me, so they can't break me. Hey, they didn't call me, so they can't qualify me. I remember when I planted Discovery Church, Little almost eight years ago now, there were some people who thought I was too young to start a church. Who's this kid? He, I'm not, they said I wasn't educated enough. I only had my bachelor's degree. I wasn't educated. I didn't know enough church. I don't come from church background, faith, religion. I didn't know church or tradition. But when I looked at the scriptures of what it meant to be a pastor, I didn't see master's degree or pedigree. I saw that God was looking for a man after his own heart. So if you're feeling disqualified, <laughs> I do too at times. <laughs> David did at times. And it's not, it's not wrong that you feel this way. It's what you do when you feel this way. See, because when David felt it, he felt disqualified. He's, he put his soul in check. He would talk to his soul and say, soul, why are you so discouraged within me? Why are you depressed? Soul, put your hope in God. David had insecurities, but he dealt with them with God. Saul had insecurities and he didn't deal with them and it destroyed the kingdom and it destroyed him. So Samuel took that, takes that flask and he anoints David and the Bible says that the power of God came on him from that day and Samuel returned to Ramah. David would be the, first, the future king of, of Israel. Um, he was anointed but not yet appointed. See, for every anointing and appointing, there is a process and a preparation. Well, I'm going to say that again because you're not talking back to me, man. I know the people online are shouting right now better than you're shouting in this room. <laughs> For every anointing and appointing, there is a process and preparation. Jesus would say it this way. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are appointed and anointed, but few go through the process of preparation. 
So what was, what was the process? What was the preparation of a king? What did that look like? I'm gonna tell you what it was. It was, it's faithfulness. Faithfulness. Let me give you the areas of faithfulness that, that David was prepared to be king. Number one, he was faithful in the field. He was faithful in the field, right where God had, had, had him. Hey, stop demanding that God promote you and just be faithful in the field that he's called you. Stop waiting for what you want and start handling what you have. If, if you haven't heard, check this out. If you haven't heard a new assignment, then be content and faithful in your current assignment. It, it, I remember when God called me and, and placed a calling in my heart, and I didn't know how or when or where or what it was going to look like. I just served wherever the need was. I just served and made a difference in people's lives, whether it was in children's ministry or outreach or in groups. I loved groups and pouring my heart and life into men of God. I loved groups. This is so important for many of you because you are right now investing, investing yourself in places that you don't understand. God is preparing you for something greater. David wasn't taking care of his own sheep. He was taking care of his father's sheep. He was being prepared to take care of the sheep of Israel, God's sheep. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 16, not in your notes, but you all know the scripture where Jesus says, be faithful in the little and you will be given the much. Just right after that, he says, Jesus says, and if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should I trust you with things of your own? Someone say faithful in the field. You want, you want to be prepared for destiny, for glory? You want to be prepared to step into what God has called you? Be faithful in the field God has called you. Here's the second thing. He was faithful in the familiar. Here's the challenging thing about familiarity. The more familiar you are, the less faithful you become. Some of you got too familiar with your marriage. You got too familiar with that person you said, I do to. And little by little, you stopped honoring, dating her like you used to, wooing her, respecting him, because you see the bathroom him. I don't know. You see the behind the scenes him. <laughs> but here's, here's David. David, after he was anointed, hey, God, he went right back into the field. He didn't go to the palace. He went right back to the field tending sheep. Man, this is, this is boring, God. Been doing this for long. Like, what, when is this, this going to stop, God? When are, you gonna, when are we going to move on from this? You got to be faithful in the familiar. Here's the next thing. He was faithful in the forgotten. When his dad forgot him, when his dad didn't include him, when even his own siblings maybe not, didn't include him, we don't have all the stories and the glimpse of all that was happening behind the scenes. But I can tell you in knowing the stories and knowing the Psalms that when he was forgotten, David in his heart, I bet, said, that's okay. I have a father to the fatherless, my God. In you, I put my hope, not in my family. In you, I put my, teach me your ways, God. Lead me in your truth, God. In you, I put my hope all day long. Not in my dad, not in my siblings, not in this home. You are my God. You are my king. Be faithful in the forgotten. Now, if you do feel forgotten, can I just tell you, you are mistaken. God has not forgotten you. He has not left you. He has not abandoned you. If you feel forgotten, I'm telling you, that's a mistake. What I learned is to worship and surrender in the seasons of obscurity. To worship and surrender in the seasons of, of obscurity. Because what looks like humiliation is just preparation for an acceleration. Come on, somebody. What looks, like, what looks like a humbling season, a setback, a rejection. Honestly, that's the, that's the tools and the ingredients that God is using to prepare you for the destiny he's called you. So what is God using right now to shape you? What is he using to form you and to mold you and to bring out inside of you what he has called your destiny in you? Little did I know that praying for and taking care of those babies years ago in that nursery that God was one. Little did I know that, that teaching the toddlers or cleaning the church for years, doing my job with excellence and joy, walking with integrity, faithfully honoring my bosses and my leaders, little did I know that God was watching my heart and preparing the way. Little did I know. Now, some of you, you may not, 
be walking faithful today. I don't know what the past is, but I can tell you today's a good day to start saying, I'm going to start being faithful. I'm going to start being faithful in the field. I'm going to start being faithful in the familiar things that God has given me today. I'm going to start being faithful even in the forgotten when it looks like I'm overlooked. God knows who I am. God sees my heart. And then number four, he was faithful in the future. Now you say, well, how does, how does someone be faithful in the future? Well, the second you find out what's in front of you, that's how. How do you respond? Now, the Bible doesn't say that, that Samuel actually told David he was going to be king. The, the, as the story unfolds, it implies this, that David kind of knows he's going to be king. But one of the scholars, Josephus, actually says that when Samuel was anointing him, he whispered in, in David's ear, you're going to be the next king of Israel. What do you do with that? How do you respond to that when God shows you your future? You know, one of the greatest indicators of maturity is how you handle authority. One of the greatest indicators of how mature you are in Christ, do you get a big head? Do you stop what you're doing? Do you go, I'm done with these sheep. You handle your own sheep, Jesse. I'm out. I ain't call you dad no more, Jesse. What do you do? What do you do? This is, this is like the contrast. The big contrast between David and Saul has to do with this right here. It's, it's, it's how he handled authority, how both of them handled authority. How, the, the level of their maturity, both of them, what they, what they did with the potential and opportunity that, that God gave them, the, the, the posture of their heart. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, it tells the story of, of Saul's downfall. And you can go read this later the whole story if, if you want i encourage you to go read your scripture and in the whole story but the bible says that that samuel goes to saul and gives him the assignment that god god gave samuel and here was the assignment he said samuel saul i want you to, to god wants you to go and exercise judgment over this neighboring kingdom king agag and they're just they're, they're wanting evil against israel and they're practicing evil things and sacrifices and all kinds of idol worship saul you're to exercise god's judgment and and, and when you do, you are to destroy everything, even all the riches and the gold and the cattle. Don't take any of that stuff. I want you to just wipe everything out, for that is God's judgment. Saul doesn't do that. The Bible says that Saul and his men spared King Agag's life because that's what all the other kings would do. They would like, they'd take him as a trophy and keep him in chains, keep all the kings in chains and in bondage and take them out when they have parties. All the kings I've conquered, look at my Look at all my glory here. And so Saul keeps Agag. And he kept the best of the sheep and goats and cattle, the fat calves, the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to him. Everything that looked good to him. And the Bible says that they destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. And little did he know that the Lord was watching his heart, not just his actions, but his heart. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king. For, he says, he's not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. So God sends Samuel to go confront Saul. You go read this story. I'm just going to summarize it for you. God sends Samuel to go confront Saul. And Saul puts on a mask, puts up a front, he even argues kind of with Samuel a little bit. Oh, I've done everything that the Lord has commanded. And, and, and this, this, is, this is what God wanted. I've done it. I've defeated, I've defeated Agag. And, and he battles with Samuel over it and covers up his, his sin. See, this is the big difference, man, of like Saul. when he, he was only heartbroken because he got caught, not because he dishonored God. And David, when he gets caught, he is heartbroken because he grieves God not because he's found out. There's a big difference between Saul. Look, both of them had, like they both had potential. Saul had potential. Saul, well, Saul was even opportunity as well. They both had potential and opportunity, both of them. But the only difference was their heart. See, not in your notes, but your potential will get you the opportunity, but your heart posture will get you the victory. And this summarizes the difference of, of King Saul's reign 
in King David's reign. Doesn't matter how much potential you have, how much education you have, how much money you have, how much status you have, how much experience you have. It does not matter the potential. Even me as a pastor and like as a leader, I can give people, I can see potential and give them opportunity, but I can't give you a heart. Only God can give you a heart. God says, I'll put a new heart with you. Exchange the heart of stone for a heart of flesh. I'll put a new spirit inside of you. And this was the difference of the reign of Saul and the reign of David. The scriptures in Acts chapter 13, verse 22 in the New Testament, speaking of David, it says, after removing Saul, he made David their king. And God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, look what he says, a man after my own heart. And here's the difference. He's going to do everything that I want him to do. He's not going to get caught up in what the world is doing, in what the neighboring nation is doing, in what the Joneses are doing, in what another church or another ministry or another leader or another pastor or another whatever is doing. No, no, he's going to do what I want him to do. So what did David do to become a man after God's own heart. What can we do to be a man, to be a woman after God's own heart? Let me give you a few things. Take some notes with me today. Here's the first thing that we need to do that David did. Seek the presence of God. Seek the presence. See, in our life, we end up seeking a lot of things. You are right now seeking a lot of things. Some of you are seeking a relationship. Some of you are seeking promotion or money or status or business. Some of you are seeking, oh, maybe fun, excitement. What I don't know what you're, you're seeking a lot of things, and it's not wrong to have any other desires or to seek after things. It's, it's your priority of what you're seeking. And David had a priority that he was going to seek the presence of God as the utmost priority in his life. Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, he says, you make known to me the path of life. You, God, are the one who fills me with joy. Joy is only found in your presence. I'm not looking for joy, and nor can I find this joy in anything in this world. Somebody say amen, okay? You, I'm not going to find joy in my money or in the pleasures or in people. I'm not going to find it. I can find measures of happiness, but I know, God, that in your presence is the joy that I need. With eternal pleasures, they're not, they don't come from this world. Hey, the eternal pleasures, they come from your hand, God. And I want to be close to you. I want to be clo so close to you that, that I can sense the hand of God, that I receive the, the, the hand of God in my life. David, he, he loved and honored the presence and sought after the presence of God so much that under King Saul, the Ark of the Covenant, which, which, symbol, which was a symbol of the presence of God, was actually taken by the Philistines was in a, another nation. He did everything that he could. He, he, he did everything he could to get that ark, to get the presence of God back in Israel where it belonged. And that kind of is, is a symbol for us, you guys, that, that we would do the same if we ever get to a place in our life where the presence of God is just, is just not there. We don't sense the presence of God, that we would abandon anything and everything that is causing any confusion or distraction in our life, and we would run hard after God, grab hold of the presence, and bring it back with us. Exodus chapter 33, Moses tells us this. He said, Moses says to God, if your presence does not go with us, don't send us from this mountain, God. Don't send us into the promised land to inherit the promise and the fruit of that land and the fruit of your promise. We don't even want it, God, if your presence don't goes with, doesn't go with us. If you want to be a man after God's own heart, you want to be a woman after God's own heart, then you need to make a priority of seeking the presence of God in your life. Number two, David studied the precepts of God. What do I mean by that? I mean, he knew his word. He knew the word of God. He loved the word of God. Um, is God's word your delight? Do you love the word of God? Is it nourishment for you? If you didn't feed on it, would you sense the starvation of your soul? Would you sense something leaving? Psalm 119, 92. David says, your law if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished 
in my affliction. Is your delight in the word of God? Do you delight? Do you love and, and study and read and devour the word of God? Because I'm telling you, there's one thing more than anything else that's, that's going to set you apart as a man or a woman of God. It's the word of God. The word of God. D.L. Moody wrote this in his Bible. It was in a note. He said, this book will keep me from sin, and sin will keep me from this book. It's a true statement. The habit of reading God's word daily is going to give you the most stability, the most peace, the most joy, the most fruitfulness that your life, in your life than anything else. So, so what is your, what, it, let me get really practical. Do you even have a Bible? Okay, let's just start right there. Some of you need to get a Bible in your life. Some of you need to start bringing your Bible to church. I know I'll give you the scriptures up here, but bring that Bible to church and crack that thing open. Highlight it and make your little note in it and study that word of God. If you don't have a Bible, grab a Bible, get a Bible. Can I, can I encourage you? Some of you need a new Bible. Let me, let me give you uh, uh, maybe a suggestion, one to get. I love the Life Application Bible Series. The Life Application Bible Series is a fantastic one. If you don't have a study Bible, that's a good one to start with. Get the NIV Life Application Bible or maybe the NLT Life Application Bible. If you don't have one, go grab one. Go get one and start studying the Word of God. It has little notes at the bottom that teaches you and kind of instructs you on, on what that Word of God is. You don't have to wait for me or somebody on a podcast to tell you what the Word of God is. You can know it. If you want to be a man after God's own heart, you need to learn how to feed yourself on the Word of God. If you want to be a woman after God's own heart, you need to know how to rightly divide the Word of truth and not be just blown by every wind of teaching and doctrine. Study the Word of God. Get on a reading plan. Go on the Bible app, and I do the one-year Bible reading plan. Do some reading plans. Get on a, a, a regimen, man, and get the Word of God in doses in your life. I'm telling you, I'm just trying to give you the secret here to be. This is David, his life. He was a man after God's own heart because he fully committed himself to do what God wanted him to do. Well, what did God want him to do? Seek his presence. That's what he wants. Seek his presence. Study the precepts. Study the word of God. Here's the third thing he did. He sang the praise of God. Some of you need to get more comfortable with God's praise. Some of you need to get more comfortable in worship. Throughout David's life, we're going to see this recurring thread, this recurring theme that that, that I think is a hallmark. It's, it's one of the anchors of being a man or a woman after God's own heart is to, is to sing, glorify, edify the Lord with your praise, with your worship. I'm telling you, it is not by power or prominence. It's your praise that gets you promoted with God. It's your praise. It's not, it's not what you have done, how strong you are, how smart you are. I'm telling you, David learned the secret. It's your praise that is going to get you promoted with God. 73 of the Psalms are directly attributed to David. Almost all the Psalms are either a hymn or a prayer. Most of the Psalms of David were written during his difficult times, his rough times. That's the times where your praise needs to be the loudest, is in the, is in the deserts and in the storms and in the tragedies and difficulties. Psalm chapter 34, verse 1, he says, I will praise the Lord. What? At all times, not just on Sunday morning at 9 a.m., I will praise the Lord at all times, not just when it's going good and I'm getting my prayer requests and, and my kids are acting right and my spouse is, 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 is doing what they're supposed to be doing. No, no, no. I'm going to praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. Psalm 104, 33, could have given you so many of these. I will sing to the Lord all my life. Here's a commitment. If you want to be a man or woman after God's own heart, then you need to make this commitment. I am going to sing the praises of God all my life in every season, in every trial. I will bless the Lord at all times. I'm going to praise God. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live, is what the scripture says. So you want to be a man after God's heart, a woman? Get comfortable with praising God. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. Jump and shout a little bit. Don't do it in just in here. Maybe practice it at home, man. I'm telling you, see, I, I got more on this. I'm going to, we have uh, once a month, on the fourth Wednesday of every month, we do a night of worship here at Discovery. And some of you 
need to, you need to, you've never been comfortable or even attracted to the presence of God like that, to the praise and worship. Maybe you're more of like, I'm a word guy and I'm not a, you know, I just know the music side. I just like the word side. God likes it when you praise. He does. He'll, he'll start promoting you if, you if you start praising him. I promise you. And some of you need to come to worship night and get your praise on and get a little uncomfortable, get a little awkward. And, and we're actually going to continue to talk about David. I'm just going to stay on the David theme. I'm just going to share a little bit about David at night of worship. And then we're just going to continue to worship. Number four, you want to be a man or a woman after God's heart. You got to serve the purposes of God. Serve the purposes of God. Oh, I love this verse. Acts 13, 36, the ultimate definition of a life well lived. I love that. I love what Jesus says of, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. I said, I want to hear that when I get to heaven. I want you to hear that. And I pray that over you specifically, pray that over discovery that you would hear that. But this right here is the definition of a, wife, a life well lived. For David, after he had served the purposes of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his father's. One of the important reasons why God called David a man after his own heart was that he was always willing to do God's will and fulfill his desires. Finding and fulfilling the will of God for your life must be the greatest goal of your life. Not your, not your own ambitions and dreams, but finding and fulfilling the will of God for your life must be the greatest goal of your life, because neither the past nor future generations can serve God's purposes in this generation. Only we can, like Esther, God created us for such a time as this. The Bible says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And if you want to receive the smile of God, the provision of God, if you want, want God's eyes to find you, you got to be a man after God's own heart. Serve the purposes of God. And lastly, surrender to the plan of God. I, psalm 139 is a beautiful psalm. I, I just gave you one verse in your handout. I'm going to read you like from verse 1 here, you guys, because this, this I think, is just, will you, I'm going to read this, but will you receive this from God? Like this is, this is your word. This is, this is the word of God for you today. Check it out. You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. God sees it. God saw it all. He saw when you, he saw when you got up and you were down. You perceive my thoughts even from afar. You discern my going and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, Know it completely. You hem me in be behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. For even though you saw it all and you know it all, you created me, God. You designed me my inmost being. You knit me together. He says, you knit me together. You knit me together. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know them full well. And then he says this, surrender, surrender, surrender. Search me. God and know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. And here's what I want you to do, God. I want you to get it all out. Nothing hidden from you. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Surrender to God. Can I pray for you? Pray that over your life today with every head bow, every eye closed, and online with us today. Every head bow and eye close. God, we surrender. We surrender. It's what you desire. Not sacrifice, not offering, but obedience. 
So we surrender. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today or you're watching online, maybe you've never expressed those words, that declaration of surrender to God. It's actually what salvation is. That's the, that's the best picture of salvation, surrender to God. With no stirring, I mean, just yet, just if everyone could just give me a moment with every head bowed and eye closed. If you're here and you need to do that maybe for the very first time and, and surrender control of your life to Jesus, or maybe you need to do it again, today's the day. I would love to pray for you for this to be a day, a fresh start, a new beginning reigning right now in your life. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. And that's it. One prayer away today from a fresh start. So with every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you, I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but I want to pray with you right where you're at. Here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to count to three. And at the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. And if you're online, I want you to type in the chat, I need Jesus on the count of three. With every head bowed, if you're ready to surrender the control, to be a man, a woman for God's own heart today that can start a new heart and a new spirit. You can get that right now. Come on. One, two, three. Lift up your hand and be bold. I need Jesus today. I need a fresh start today. Leave it up. Come on. Yes, 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 yes. All over here. Yeah, yeah. Amen, amen, amen. Here, yes, 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 yes. Yes, praise God. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Amen. Here too. Yeah. yeah God sees it. Whatever, if you go ahead and put your hand down. Even those of you that snuck it up, snuck it down. I saw you. God saw you. Come on. Will you pray something like this? Jesus, forgive me for my past, my mistakes, my sins. Today I acknowledge I need you. And I'm tired of doing it without you acting like I'd do it without you. I don't want to live like a King Saul, covering it up, acting like everything's okay. Today, I take the mask off. And I say, I need you. I'm lost without you. Jesus, I declare that you are my Savior, my God. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, for setting me free. God, I pray over every person that's here, that's watching today. That today would be the beginning of a, of a fresh start, a beginning of a new journey. That, that we would be men and women after your heart. That we would prioritize your presence, your word in our life. That we wouldn't be afraid of the uncomfort of praise and worship, but that we would go all in and all out for you and serve your purposes, surrendering to your plan. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, if you receive that word, will you give God some praise? Amen. Amen.